Awesome. So tell me about release train. All right. So um, this whole discussion, actually, let me step back before I even start. Um, I've been talking about the next step with, uh, with Alessio. And when I say next step, I mean way in the future. Like, how can we actually deploy commits even without merging them? How do we actually roll out experiments even before we consider uh, all of the reviews? So um, basically doing the bleeding edge thing under certain uh, restrictions, right? Like what, what kind of experiments would you be able to do almost in production um, without actually merging things? So like we talked about this maybe a couple of months ago. Um, and during the AMA with the delivery on Wednesday, Sid actually had a, a discussion point basically on how do we cut down the time between two commits being deployed two changes being deployed to an environment. In this case, we were talking about Canary. Uh, given that there is always a running time between the moment the commit is actually merged, so available in the main branch, versus it being deployed. Because there is always something, right? Like you either need to deploy it or you need to build something so you can deploy it somewhere you need to do some level of testing. So that can be, that can last for hours. And that's a common thing in a lot of places, not only with us. And the idea in general is how do you ensure that if you can't cut that time down to negligible, which in majority of cases you can't, how do you ensure that consecutive commits can actually be um, deployed also consecutively, even if, uh, from the moment of them being merged to the moment of them being deployed, we talk about ours. So to explain a bit differently right now, what usually happens is you merge something into master, right? Your commit lands there. So commit A is there. Commit B follows right after, maybe like a minute later, in some cases, seconds later, right? So what happens is you build your deployment artifacts, you start deploying to non-prod environments, you do all sorts of QA on it, um, and you roll that out to production. Once you're certain of any of these steps are okay, right? Like when you have sufficient confidence, then only you start talking about commit B. And then between commit A and commit B, you might have hours in between, even though they got merged seconds apart. So the yeah. idea with the release trains is, as I understand uh, Sid's point, is how do we ensure that that distance between commit gets preserved also on that end of deployment while still having that running time of building, deploying, and so on and so on. So to say this another way, uh, it would be to parallelize the changes of commit A and commit B so that they are deployed at the same time that they enter into the, yes. the change. Yes. Okay. That's wonderful. That's the general, I think, concept. Um, basically, how do you make sure that the time between the changes being deployed is the smallest possible regardless of the running time? Uh, I think Sid mentioned transit time we called it transit time because there was no better name uh, for it I, and i couldn't find a better name for it as well so this morning i was discussing like while i was writing that issue up i was discussing um, um like brainstorming a bit with alessio who knows a lot about merge trains because he participated in those de in that development back then and basically like if you strip all of it down release trains are basically just mer merge trains for releases, right? Like it's no different. Um, I was and thinking it was actually more like a merge train for an environment. So you could batch all of your changes for a target environment uh, so that they're running all the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and um, as we were discussing that, like there was a lot of complexity that gets added, like quite a lot. And uh, if you do this two times, that doesn't make sense. Like if you have a merge train, right? Like how does the merge train right now work? You have the uh, commit, the merge commit in the merge request itself is 
um, like a branch is created out of master, that commit is added. So you have a detached branch, so a separate branch on which the pipelines actually run, right? So this is the detached pipeline that you might see in the merge request. And then you add the merge request to, to the train in a certain order. And this way you kind of guarantee that um, merge request one and two have um, that same order um, so that your master doesn't run away uh, as you merge things. Meaning merge request one has commit A, merge request two has commit B. You ensure that you have master plus A and master plus A plus B in that order if everything is okay with the pipelines, right? And that is the same concept as what we want to do with release streams. So as we were discussing, we realized more and more that if we could shift that all the way to the left and keep it at the same sequence, right? Like keep it at the same time as uh, merge trains, theoretically, we could achieve that relatively simply. Basically, the decision of whether something should be merged or not um, becomes a bit more complex because right now the idea is, is the pipeline you created successful? Yes, great, then you're merging it. But in this case, if we add more logic to it, we would have something like, is the environment the merge request is going to be deployed to going to be healthy after this deployment is done, right? So that kind of complicates that decision of whether you should merge or not. But we already have majority of components in place for this. We have the environments, we have merge trains. So the only thing I, like from that discussion I had with him, the only thing that we need to do is like expand the logic of um, how do you define merge trains? How do you define what is being done while the merge train is running? So theoretically you could have your pipelines. So the unit tests, for example, run at the same time as you're building your deployment artifacts. And it is like once that is complete, it really doesn't matter how long it, it lasts. You execute a deployment to an environment and based on the monitoring system that we already have in place, um, you observe whether there is like an elevated number of errors, right? Like you define something and based on that, you get the return information and that tells you, all right, this commit A is not causing any issues or anything like that, this is okay. The test pass, the deployment pass, the metrics are okay. It's ready to go. And you already to have- the next it. stage. Well, the next stage is already basically production because you already deployed it to an environment that is not production. You already measured something against that environment um, so basically that commit is ready to be merged into main branch. And because you've already built everything in order to deploy and test, you can just promote that all the way to whatever the production environment is, like however you define it, right? Okay. So, I mean, I'm oversimplifying it here, right? Obviously, because there is like a lot of really uh, hard moving pieces there, but that is, I think the general concept and that way you will always have commit A and commit B, which are one um, um, next to another, right? Like the- They enter into the, the chain. They enter into the, yeah, inter, entering into the chain the same way. And if both of them are okay, they are going to also be deployed in that same order because they pass the same criteria, right? Like the same um, rules that you set, right? Now things get seriously complicated if something fails, but I think this is something we already decided to not immediately tackle with merge trains. As far as I remember, if a merge fails in the merge train, you remove it from- Yeah, you just bump it out. Yeah, you bump it out and then you repeat the whole process with everything, right? Like you build, after that, you rebuild it from the last known so it's the same concept as well. Like you would remove the failed one and you have to redeploy to the environment and retest. 
uh, redo the QA testing and so on. But that is pretty much the same, I think. Concept. So why doesn't merge trains go all the way through to production today? Because it's not supposed to be doing any sort of um, release and environment releases, uh, um, related items. Merge train right now is only for commits. For branches. For branches and commits. Right? So would we want to support this on both uh, tags and environments? That's a great question. Well, does it matter though? Because so, tags, tags are a completely different beast in this case, because we are talking here about um, deploying for from the main branch. Um, and main branch doesn't necessarily get tagged. Like it's a completely different problem, I think. Unless if they're deploying to production. Only if they deploy only to production. on tags. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like if, if you deploy fully on tags, but I don't I don't think that is the problem we are trying to resolve here. Like, for example, at GitLab.com, the only reason why we deploy on tags right now is because our system was initially built with tags in mind. We are, we are basically deploying from commits these days. It's just that the rest of the system is built that way. So it's easier for us to just, it was easier for us just to adapt that and fit it into the structure. So that's why we are tagging. We, we don't need tags right now apart, well, from the fact that we have legacy system. Um, yeah, we... I'm thinking about this use case um, broader. So uh -huh. trying to build it for people who are looking to like sequence their deployments across multiple applications and they're tagging those microservices right. and then they want to create dependencies between these projects and they could use release trains in this case. Um, now, that is an unsolved problem here because like if hmm. things get really complex, when you start talking about gitlab.com like systems right like yeah. this we've been talking about this uh, release stream problem only in one specific case which is your single project is the project that gets deployed somewhere right where the challenge comes from is if we have to do it for like gitlab.com type deployments where you have like multiple projects 10 15 projects and then the dependencies are flying around right but that might be doable if you think about a single project that is downstream from all of those dependencies, for example. And that is the, your gate, that is your control where you well, test I a number of different projects and that's like how you merge the versions and how all of these things behave depends on the uh, upstream projects, basically. Right, so I could see a really, cool place where we create like a multi-project pipeline for these multiple projects and they all have their own release train and then it merges into a different project for verification of your release candidate to then deploy to production so you have mm -hmm. all of these like target uh changes on their own release chain release trains in their projects mm -hmm. deploying to a new target environment which is a staging or canary and then that change gets promoted into production. Um, yeah. But it would require like us to have the coordination of multiple release trains in each of these separate projects. Um, yeah, and no, this really depends on the projects that you have. So in a simplified version, you don't even need that. You only need that single project that is going to be the controller or coordinator in this mm -hmm. case, right? Yeah. So it will be picking all of those different commits and assembling the actual deployment so that it can then use the release uh, train. That is in a simplified way. In a more complex way, which is if you actually have the uh, microservice, microservice services, <laughs> um, you then don't necessarily need that coordinator, right? Like then individual projects do need that release train and you have like more complex interactions between different components right right because it may be like uh, project b needs a to pass on the release train in order to Correct. go through and then you'd create like dependent uh, dependent release train yeah but um, that that is like a super complex use case um i think like if we strip it down 
all the way to let's think about a single project and let's think about how that single project can uh, run um, its deploy through, right? And its commits, it commits, wow, English today. Um, the commits of, of its own, right? How can that project run that through uh, while shortening that transit time? Yeah. Um, then it becomes, later it becomes a case that becomes your building block and you can add more complexity on top, right? Like add multiple projects and think about it on a, on a different level. Okay, this is, this is good. So if I was to restate this um, in just a, a use case statement so that I can put this in front of my engineers to then like tell me how to break it down. Uh, for our mono repo organization, we want to reduce the time between two commits entry into a production deployment. Mm -hmm. And in order to accomplish that, we need to maintain the time between those two commits from their entry to the exit of each stage. Don't necessarily need to maintain that time. It's more about, uh, it's a different type of sequential. Right. Um, it's more about making sure that you can um, deploy those commits in um, an order, right? In sequence. In an order, yeah. Mm -hmm. In an order that, um, as long as that that distance between them don't, doesn't grow because of the transit time. Let's put it that way. That's right? exactly what I'm trying to like articulate in this use case. Really hard, like, yeah, because yeah. we we're okay with it being the same and ideally it reduces. So as much as that we can parallelize between the entry yeah. and the exit to a production environment. Um, yeah. So for example, like say that B is a super small change, B commit, and it doesn't need to run all of the unit tests or the integration yeah. tests or any other tests that or scans that commit a does potentially commit B could go all the way through and then wait for commit A uh, and Definitely. then commit A gets batched with commit B and then it runs through the release candidate pipeline. Um, and in that case, it's like, it's okay if commit B surpasses commit A through that first transit time, but in exactly. the end, we still want commit A and commit B to be batched and bundled. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Because what I want to do is just give the team as much freedom to think about this problem, my engineers, mm -hmm. um, and give them just like a very simple statement. And then we can start going through edge cases and, um, and problems. I do want to build something that is dog foodable for us. And that's also applicable to users who deploy on tags. So um, those no. are going to be like four or five iterations forward. But I just want yeah. to keep those things in mind. Now, this is where things become complicated for us, specifically on GitLab.com, mm -hmm. because we have the monolithic deployment structure. Right. It becomes really, really hard to dog food this because there are too many. Um, um, oh, but it could be like runner dog fooding this. It, can, yeah, like it, does, it doesn't have to be like. It doesn't Gitlab. have to be that. Like it can be a component of the whole deployment process, oh. right? Like it it can be dog foodable it's just not the, like you can dog food at this moment i guess that's what i'm trying to say the other thing that sid mentioned that i didn't really have the time to look into is um spinnaker apparently spinnaker does this really well and um i see that you already looked into uh, some competitive landscape there um maybe you can take a look at spinnaker as well um like if you have an opportunity to check it out I just didn't have the time to look into it um, as well myself. It's tricky because nobody calls this the release chain, but they no. call it like safe deployments or deployment queuing or deployment schedules. So that's what took me a really long time to like yeah. parse is how do we articulate what release trains are to the market? Because the market is like, oh, I just want to schedule and sequence my deployments. Or if, we're, if I'm truly CD, I want to schedule and sequence each change I'm making. Yeah. Um, because uh, people are committing straight to production, you know, like in yeah. their, in their minds, right? Yeah. In their minds. <laughs> in their minds. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yeah, I know. I know it's hard, but like I didn't know how to title this different than uh, sits at canary trains, but that didn't really click with me mostly because canary is just an, an environment or stage in an environment, right? For me, this is this is still the merge trains functionality, but it's going to yes. be merge trains scope to environments so that we sequence all the commits for a particular environment in the yes. same order, and then we batch them and we run them through their release pipeline to go to the end production state. So that's what I'm thinking we'll position this as like in the market and then it'll combat against all of the deployment queuing, the dependencies that other competitors are doing. Um, yeah. and I think it's it'll afford us a, gr a great amount of um, attraction from our CI users trying to transition to CD because if they're already adopting merge trains, then this is like a natural extension of their current process, exactly. rather than introducing this thing called release train, which is also what agile thinks of when they think is safe. And I want to like, not have that. I don't want to, <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't want people to look at that and be like, oh, they're trying to be safe at GitLab. No, 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 that's not what, not what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, but no. I love I love this name of release trains. I think it's great from an internal nomenclature. But yeah. in the in the market, we'll probably talk about this as um, a safe deployment for merge trains for environments. Yeah, but that's that's the general problem I have general uh, with with our merge trains. It's really a mouthful. Like if you talk about merge trains, you need um, how did we call it D detached pipelines as well, right? Like merge. I forgot the name even. Like it's a super long name. Um, Merge with pipeline merge results, results or yeah, merge, results merge or something results. like that. I think we changed it a couple of times already because it was so hard. So, um, oh, because you have to have pipelines for merged results in order to have merge trains. In exactly, it. exactly, exactly. That's what I was saying. So, theoretically, if if we have a way to, um, I know that there is some way to configure a pipeline to only run in that state as well, but I don't really know how that works. Um, and maybe if we can, like in that state, if we can plug in this uh, talk with the environments, uh, understanding which um, position you are in the merge train, and so on, it might be possible to actually do all of those things with environments much simply because we already have the logic from our trains. Right. And one's a positioning thing and go to market and how we name the feature and the other is like how it actually works in practice. So they may be completely different features mm -hmm. on the back end and working. Um, yeah. And we may continue to call them release trains. It's just, I want to be mindful of how this is when people are using Spinnaker and they're using deployment sequencing, which is what it's called on the Spinnaker side, um, or they're using CircleCI and they're using deployment queuing, I want them to know that they can go to GitLab to do deployment scheduling um, or in, or app promotion, yeah. which is what it's called in I other see, places. I like, see how tough this is. Like naming is the hardest, obviously, but oh my God, that deployment scheduling, that sounds odd because I'm not really scheduling a deploy. Yeah. yeah, it's sequencing. That's exactly it. Like it's, it's yeah, it's you're putting this thing in sequence for sure. But um, yeah, anyway, it's we'll we'll, we'll figure it out. I'll definitely look at Spinnaker though next in my competitive analysis. But this was super helpful. Um, thank you for thinking of this idea and for coming back to me. Did you record your your That's call my, with Sid? Not <laughs> this, was, this was AMA delivery AMA. Not my idea. Okay. To be clear. This is uh, Sid mentioning things uh, and then me thinking about it and then me getting Alessio who was thinking about this. And uh, it just kind of tied a couple of ends because we did think about how can we actually speed this up a couple of months ago. Uh, but we decided yeah. to hold for Kubernetes because Kubernetes allows us to do some of these things much, much, much quicker for gitlab.com. Right. And now that Sid mentioned this specific sync, sequ sequencing, actually ties really well with what we discussed uh, uh, earlier. And as Kubernetes is now rolling out to .com, we are seeing like significant drop in deployment times and it allows us to maybe think about these things. And we get some things for free, for example, in Kubernetes where mm -hmm. we can roll things out independently. We have multiple clusters already, right. so we can roll out multiple different changes uh, to different users without 
uh, a seriously significant investment in new tooling or whatever, right? Like we already have come or get it for free from for Kubernetes. So um, some of it at least. So. Right. Cool. Anyway, Perfect. thanks. Um, thanks. Let me know when you have the link for this. Um, and oh no, it's on YouTube. It. What? Yeah. On YouTube. We'll, talk, yeah. we'll talk soon. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.